there just in the nick of time. What does that make us? Big damn heroes, sir. Ain't we just? Let's talk about your reviews uh, a little bit regarding intravenous de Milo. This tasteless cover is a good indication of the lack of musical invention within. The musical growth rate of this band cannot even be charted. They are treading water in a sea of retarded sexuality and bad poetry. Well, that's, that's nitpicking, isn't it? You know what this is? It's the world's smallest violin playing just for the waitresses. Hello and welcome to Shoot the Breeze on Resonance 104.4 FM, a film and TV radio show where a handful of film enthusiasts shoot the breeze about all things film and television. I am Marcus E. Ako, and the movie at which I first cried was Animal Farm. And I am Laura Sampson, and the movie at which I first cried was... The never-ending story. And with us in the studio today, uh, the director of High Low Joe. Please tell us your name and the movie at which you first cried. My name is James Kermack, and the film that we cried is uh, Scrooged with Bill Murray. Also with us in the studio, please tell us your name and the movie that first made you cry. My name is Nick Sadler, and the first film that made me cry was Watership Down. <sighs> okay, so Watership Down... <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Watership Down is... Uh... That's the first film that completely ruined me. Yeah. I think, I mean, crying just doesn't even come close to touching what that film did to me. Yeah, oh, my goodness. It, it, it's it flashbacks. It taught me fear. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so uh, why why did you have to go with that one? I mean, yeah, I, no... It was my first memory of crying to a film. I was, I was six years old, and I was watching it by myself, and I remember my father was in the shower, and I just I got up when you know that that scene at the end when the, the you know it all goes red and they're all getting slaughtered. Yep. And I don't know what to do, and I just ran into you know to the shower, and I was like, oh, dude. I didn't even know what. Yeah, saying. Laura, stop it, stop it. I know you're about to start crying. <laughs> it's, it, it's, and I'm it, not crying, but my heart is already starting to beat a bit faster <laughs> yeah. at that memory. I it took me another decade to watch it again after that first time. Yeah, see, I, it didn't affect me. And I was afraid of rabbits. It didn't affect me that much. I mean, I'm 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 it just, it's just dusty in in here, so it's not it's uh, yeah. Um, and uh, James, you talked about Scrooged. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, so Bill Murray. Bill Murray's a legend. In fact, uh, it's, it's, all, it's almost Christmas as well. Are you going to be watching it this Christmas? Yeah, well, yeah, I'm gonna, I watch it every Christmas. I watch it once a day, December 1st to 25th, uh, yeah. every day. Okay. Uh, it's a superb film. Uh, yeah, when the little lad comes up at the end and he's like, you know, hasn't spoken for the whole film or his whole life. Yeah, see, for me, the the, the speech alone, I mean, his, his speech at the end, that just basically, it gets me going. And when the um, when the boy comes up, it's sort of like, nope, that's it. I need to stop the movie at this point because obviously it's uh, it's all lost for me. So, yeah, it's done. Uh, I mentioned Animal Farm because that's the first one I remember. And it's the one scene in particular where uh, if you, it's it's based on the um, George Orwell book, the, uh, the Animal Farm. And there's, uh, when after the pigs have taken over and there's the donkey and the horse and they are working at the windmill, and some the bale of hay falls down, and you know, injures the the horse, and then the horse gets carted away to the hot the, to the veterinary hospital, as um, air quotes, uh, and then the doors slam shut, and you see glue factory. And the donkey's trying to stop the the horse. He realizes what's going on, and is trying to rescue the horse. And that bit just shatters me every single time. So uh, yeah. Anyway, nice nice way to bring it <laughs> to, to pump this show crying up. Crying is <laughs> crying is good for you. It's almost as good for you as swearing, apparently. Hmm. Uh, mm. It's good for you, but I do feel bad for anyone who hasn't seen these three films. We've just given away the end. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, thinking guys. about watching those. Uh, you've you've had at least twenty years to uh, have seen them. So. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, well, I was having this conversation with someone about spoiler alerts. What do we do with spoiler alerts, right? Now, okay, this, these are all movies that at least are they're people who are having kids right now who were who, who were born after this movie these movies were made. So, I mean, do we still have to announce spoiler alerts before we talk about them? We probably I think there's do. like a one year cap. One if you year. haven't seen it in a year, <laughs> you know, you're in trouble. If you don't know Bruce Willis is dead at the end then <gasps> Of Die don't Hard. Spoil, don't spoil uh, where? Hard. Um, I was going to say Hudson Hawk, but <laughs> it's fine. Everyone died in Hudson Hawk, well, the audience well, included. I liked Hudson Hawk. I, I really enjoy it, but it's not a good film. Well, okay, fair <laughs> enough. 
<laughs> okay, you're listening to Shoot the Breeze on Resonance 104.4 FM. I'm Marcus E. Ako. And I'm Laura Sampson. With us in the studio is James Carmack, the director of uh, Hi Low Joe. It's coming out on the 24th of November. Uh, we're going to be talking to him uh, about the movie. He's going to tell us all about it. We're going to ask him loads of questions. We've had a number of people who have sent us Twitter messages and Facebook messages to ask questions. So I've written down on my notepad. Uh, we'll do that. Uh, also coming up on the show, we're going to be doing UK Box Office Top 5. Uh, we'll be doing our Top 5 Film and TV Discussion. Uh, and we'll also have Netflix and Amazon Recommendations. James, did you get your uh, re- recommendation? I have. I've got one well, for Amazon, one for Netflix. Oh, I'm both. prepped. Wow, you did, you did prep. I only have Netflix. I need to step up my game. Uh, but before that, we've got uh, Film and TV News. <laughs> The film and TV news stories uh, section of the show starts with something I'm really excited about today. Um, It's happening next week and it is the Underwire Film Festival. It's a feminist film festival um, made up of over 100 short films and some features and it's happening in cinemas all over London next week. All the films are celebrating female achievement in filmmaking across lots of different disciplines of the craft of filmmaking. I've been looking forward to it for over a month and uh, I I can't wait to go and see as much of it as I can. I'm so excited about it, in fact, that I managed to talk to the festival director, Anna Bogutskaya, who uh, kindly agreed to tell me a little bit more about it over coffee at the BFI South Bank. Um, So this is Anna uh, introducing the festival. Underwire Festival is the UK's, at the moment only, and largest um, film festival celebrating female talent across the crafts. And this is what makes it unique. It was mm. set up in 2010 by a screenwriter, Gabriella, and a producer, Gemma, who essentially banded together and thought that there was nothing existing at that time that spotlighted and celebrated the variety of roles that go into creating a film. So there are a lot of film festivals. Most of them actually celebrate the, the on-screen talent, so the actors, they celebrate the directors. Um, but there's really nothing working or um, kind of working with the craftspeople behind films and particularly in the short film space as well. So that was kind of the, the, the ethos from the beginning and that has continued throughout the editions of the festival and has only grown. So we underwrite currently recognizes 12 categories, 10 of those are craft based. So, you know, everything from directors to cinematographers through sound designers production designers animators editors and this is all in the short film space and it's specifically focusing on female talent meaning that you know a short film can be directed by a man can be about men um or you know anything or anyone but what we what we recognize what we try to elevate and support is the women making those films happen not just on a directorial level not just on screen but you know everything you know the female editors the female sound designers, all of these categories, all of these areas are deeply underrepresented by women, so there's not enough um, women working in them in the industry. And what we try to do is essentially provide a platform for them to shine, to spotlight their work. Um, We also give prizes for every one of the categories, so every prize is not cash. It's got a development and mentoring aspect to it, so the whole goal is to help them progress their careers in some way, either get them in a room with relevant people that might be able to help them or open them doors, or get them, you know, free kit for their next project that can enable them to, you know, put something into more work and continue making things and getting kind of that exposure as well so they can build their portfolio and build their career and kind of jump into doing features or doing commercial work as well because all of that is kind of a rolling ball as well of you know if you go into one project then you kind of start getting more projects and getting more work that's kind of what we're trying to achieve. Well that was Anna Bogutskaya the festival director of the Underwire Film Festival. Um, I think it's great that there's a real um, helpful uh, focus for emerging filmmakers in the industry as well as people going to see films. I mean, obviously, a film festival 
it's for people watching the films, but it's also for um, people who are trying to meet other people and trying to make more films. Um, this weekend, there's a, as part of the festival, there is a conference and networking opportunity specifically aimed at emerging female filmmakers yeah. called uh, the Wired Women Weekender. And I think that looks, I mean, the, the lineup looks um, pretty exciting, what the kind of things they'll be talking about, the kind of people who are. And that's, that's, uh, that's very good. It kind of um, harks back to, the, to last week's show where we had uh, Iki Elam Ritzi come in from uh, Identity Agency Group, where she was talking more about uh, supporting uh, Bame artists, uh, black, Asian, ethnic minority artists uh, in film and television. Uh, and we discussed and said one of the main reasons why there are fewer people of Bame uh, origin on TV is because of the lack of you know, producers, the skill sets, lack of producers, cameramen, directors uh, in the in the industry. So they don't, you don't have writers of uh, ethnic minority, uh, you know, persuasion there to write stories that would talk to people of ethnic minority. Same thing for women. You have fewer women in those asp in those areas of the industry, and so the Underwire uh, Film Festival, Underwire Festival, is great, and it's one of the opportunities to to promote skill set to to build skill sets. Uh, in women who are interested in getting into the industry. Well, yeah, and it's it's great that it's so easy to actually submit a film to it. Um, when I spoke to Anna, she was really eloquent about the process of submission, and it only costs about a tenner to submit a film. Every film that they receive is watched a couple of times, and they choose as many as they can that are brilliant. So uh, um, if anyone wants to get more information about Underwire Festival, what do they need to do? The first thing to do would be go and see something there. Uh, maybe go to the Wired Women Weekender. Uh, there are still tickets available, I think, um, for this weekend. But the festival itself runs from the 22nd to the 26th. That's next Wednesday to next Sunday. And um, for, for more information about that and to book tickets, uh, the Underwire Festival website is underwirefestival.com. And they're really easy to find on social media at underwirefest. So at underwirefest. There are lots of things I want to go to, and I am looking forward to um, uh, having a chat about them next week. I know you had a list of films that you said you were going to uh, look at uh, in the festival, so we're going to put that on the Facebook page, which is for this show, which is Shoot the Breeze on Resonance 104.4 FM on Facebook, and our Twitter page is uh, at STB underscore Resonance FM. Uh, one of our guests in the studio, James Kermack, his Twitter uh, feed, uh, Twitter uh, handle is at Kermack. 82, correct? It is indeed. Yeah. Excellent. And uh, James is here to promote his new film, High Low Joe. James, can you tell us about the movie? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a romantic drama with a psychological, psychological edge. It's uh, about a guy called Joe, um, who's the life and soul of the party. He goes out drinking, gets on very well with everyone. Um, but he's actually suffering from uh, very bad depression, mental health issues, and he has been for a very long time. Um, and then he meets this girl, Ellie, at one of his parties, and uh, they fall in love, and she moves in. And then he has to basically deal with the fact that he finally has someone in very close proximity to him, so he has to deal with the mental health issues. They start to come out a bit more, um, and then she helps him to deal with them. So it's about how they get through that. Yeah, you describe the movie as uh, a, a cross between Black Swan and 500 Days of Summer. Yes. So, so you, you've got this psychological uh, psychological horror, if you will, with Black Swan, and then you've got 50, uh, 50 Days of Summer, which is the romantic... 500 Days of Summer. Sorry, five, definitely 50, not 50 Shades, 50 Shades of Grey. Of Grey. No. I, I was like, uh, it's I not Black Swan meets 50 Shades of Grey, so I definitely didn't direct that. <laughs> 50 Shades of Summer? Um, <laughs> See, now, now I've got that in my head. I can't get that out. Uh, sorry, 500... I'd be very disappointed if that's what they're coming to see. Five <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's bondage in it. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so yeah, so you've got the, you've, as you said, romantic comedy mixed with psychological drama. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, with with us uh, with us in the studio, we've got uh, Nick Sadler from uh, who's the CMO of uh, Film Label, who has basically picked up this particular film uh, and is distributing it. Is that correct, Nick? Yeah, that's uh, very correct. Wh I'm, I'm... What grabbed you about the film? Uh, well, to be honest, the director, James Kermack, we met at uh, Cannes Film Festival. You don't have to say year. that because he's in the room. We can just send him out and then you can talk. You can, he's like, nah, no, not at all. No, no one's no. listening. Of course no one's listening. <laughs> no, but it, the, the thing is, it, it all starts with a good film. And behind the film is uh, a great writer and director. And, you know, there, there are a few people out there that have got that kind of spark. And you can see it when you meet people. You know, you can tell in about 10 seconds, hey, there's something here. 
Um, and, you know, and I quickly saw that when, you know, when I first met James. And so I was like, you know, I sent the film over and then I watched it with my wife and we were like, this is, this is a, a great film. And it's, and it's not normally a film I'd typically go and see. And I was really moved by it. And, and yeah, and then, you know, we'd continue our conversations and signed it and said, let's do something with this in the UK. And here yeah. we are. I've been following the progress for this mo- of this movie for years now. So uh, when it went to Cannes... <laughs> yeah, it's it, I've been on it for like a decade. <laughs> we, uh, well, uh, well, uh, close. No, We're I'm kidding. Close, close, uh, <laughs> yeah. Which is the next question I'm going to come to you in a second. But uh, just before I get to that, um, we I read um, how it basically went and slayed at Cannes Fil- Film Festival. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, based on that, you moved off and you've got other projects, which is no secret. It's pretty much splashed all over, uh, all over media. Basically, you're now you're effectively the next whoever you want to. I, I always say the next um, Donald Glover. So, uh, so, so, so you say yeah. Glover rather than Trump. Uh, well, <laughs> you could be the next Donald Trump. If Nobody you want. wants to be the next Donald Trump. No, no. Uh, so, so High Low Joe seems to be getting a lot of uh, positive buzz. Um, and as I was saying, I've been following for quite a while. How long did it take you to get to this point? Um, well, uh, I started it about uh, five years uh, ago. Um, so I originally had another script called Knuckle Dust, which I was uh, putting around, um, which was getting a bit of traction, but it was a much bigger budget um, so to do it as my first feature was uh, proven very difficult so I decided to do a, a smaller uh, film in budget uh, but that was still very high in ambition um, and so came up with High Low Joe which is a, a much more personal film uh, so I did that worked on that for about two years on the script okay. um, and then we shot it uh, maybe two and a half years ago um, and we're in post for some time because we did a lot of post deals and people were very kind of us but it took a bit of, a, a bit of time um, and then we did some festivals and now we find ourselves here. So it's been about five years from beginning to, well, this hopefully isn't the end, but, you know, to where we are now. No, oh, of course, because now it's, uh, it premieres on uh, November 24th. Mm-hmm. Uh, View Cinema in Piccadilly? Piccadilly, yeah. Yeah, it's sold out, right? Sold out. Wow. So, yeah, I was... Yeah, um, I was lucky to get to manage to get a ticket for it. So I was like, uh, it was like, unfortunately, Laura didn't get a ticket. So uh, I'll, I'll tell you what the movie's like. Um, We're going to have a sword fight for that ticket. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you come find me first. Uh, yeah. So and and you've, you you started moving around the country to start setting you know, you setting out in different other locations as well. I think mm-hmm. Liverpool got sold out. Was uh, Liverpool? Not yet. Uh, Hull is uh, sold out. Uh, I think, um, and we're. What was the other? One? I think we're five or six from. I think it is Liverpool, isn't it? Yeah, I think Liverpool might have one as well. But we got, I think, seven, eight screenings now uh, okay. across the UK. So it's kind of a London, Brighton, Hull. Uh, we just added one in Cardiff, actually. Okay. Uh, Liverpool, Leeds, Oxford. It's mm. all over the place. Yeah. So okay. is this a is this a um, a tour of screenings with director or kind of a crew? Um, creative team Q and A yes. afterwards. Yeah, so some of them will have um, it will be me. Uh, some of them will be me and the lead actor. Some will be just the lead actor. Somebody is cinematographer Mark Nutkins. Um, so it's nice and varied. The team are very much chipping in and and hoping to be at various different dates. Excellent. You're listening to Shoot the Breeze on one, Resonance 104.4 FM. I'm Marcus E. Ako. and I'm Laura Sampson. With us in the studio is the director of High Low Joe, James Kermack, and the CMO of uh, film label Nick Sadler. Hi, guys. Hey. Uh, so, one last question I want to ask before we move on. Um, it, it's and this is this came from one of the Facebook on the Facebook page. Uh, I know you 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 do um, seminars. You've been doing seminars the last few months, mm-hmm. basically talking about how you made Hilo Joe and uh, helping filmmakers uh, sort of network and and you know try and get to that point from point A to the point where they actually get in the movie where you are. Yep. Uh, and one of the uh, questions that came in was how do you raise money to do that? Now, I, I know this story. Would you like to share it, uh, how you raise the money for this project? Um, how do I raise money? Okay, so uh, the money for this, I mean, it came from all different places. You know, we did a bit of crowdfunding um, to pull in a little bit of money. Um, we had a little bit of private investment. Um, a lot of people did work in kind, uh, came on board and helped out. Um, and a, a great deal of people did post-production deals with us. Um, but primarily, I mean, the, the way to get stuff done, I, I think, especially to make an indie feature or a, a short, is what I did was to make a list across the board of, you know, um, actors. You put actors at the top, you put cinematographer at the top, you put the first AD at the top. And then you just make the list and you go through who you know who does these jobs and you try and fill it that way. And the same with equipment, you know, you go, if you put on Facebook tomorrow, anyone and went, hey, does anyone know own a, own a camera we could shoot on? You possibly have maybe two or three people who come forward, in which case that takes away your camera cost. Mm-hmm. We didn't have that. We had a really great company called um, One Stop Rental, uh, who are absolutely fantastic, and they sorted us out with the uh, Ari Alexa to okay. shoot on, which is amazing. It's like what well, they shoot Hunger Games and the Bond films on. Okay. Um, so they were amazing. But uh, 
you know, that's the best way to, to, to try and do it first is to try and see what you already have uh, and then to try and raise the money okay. to pay for what you have to. Okay. Nick, I'm just going to throw this question to you. Um, is there anything from a distribution point of view that you can offer as sort of help in funding the movie before it gets made? Um, pretty much just everything James has said, especially on these uh, on these um, level of budget films. Um if anything, I would say make sure you leave some money for marketing because yes. it's often the very last thing, and it's and it is very hard to get the ball rolling, and you and you're relying on just your team to do it, and it's it's very hard. Um, it, it's that's all I would say. Definitely put leave some money towards. It. I mean, if you think about it, big budget Hollywood films, or even you know one million dollar budgets, they'll spend almost the same amount of money, if not more, on the marketing as what they made the film for. Um, but yeah, you won't get a $150,000 um, indie film spending $150,000 of marketing. But if they did, it, it would it would probably make its money back and, and be quite a big success. So mm. that's all I'd say on that. Uh, how valuable was the um, the festival success exposure to your marketing efforts? Do you? Uh, um, it was very it was it was great. I mean, we, we the first one we went to was the BFI Expo in 2016 um, with Helen McKenzie and her team um, who got us in there. And so I think it was only four or five films who got picked up by first time directors. Um, one of which was myself, and one of which was a, another great film called Moon Dogs, which came out earlier in the year by Philip John. Um, and so that was fantastic. We had one screening there, and that's for just industry people. And luckily, we had uh, a sales agent come in, uh, and they really liked it. An LA based sales agent, so they took it. Um, and also we had um, people from the Dinard Film Festival, um, which is an amazing festival in, in France. Um, it was in its 27th year when we went. Um, and that was amazing for us because it's very well respected. Um, I mean, the year we were there, you know, it was with uh, Kate Dickey and, and Phil Davis and Jason Fleming and all, all these wonderful people. Um, and to be a part of that was fantastic. You know, it, it, was, a, it was a great deal of validation because you were... We were treated, well, I was treated as a director, especially exactly the same as everyone else. You know, I was there with the same time as Ken Loach, which was insane. And you're being treated with respect. And, you know, so for that, it was fantastic it's validation for me. Were you selected to chair one of the panels at some point? Yeah, so basically they also had, a, it was the first ever year of the Shortcuts jury, which okay. is the short films uh, jury. So there were four of us. Um, and uh, that that was fantastic as well. Uh, there was a you know first time to do that, and uh, some great films there. The one we actually chose uh, to win was the one that also won the BAFTA, which is Operator, um, by Caroline Bartley, which is an amazing film starring Kate Dickey. Um, if you know Kate, she was uh, in Red Road, yeah. uh, the witch filth. Um, wonderful, wonderful woman. And uh, yeah, so the festival really, really helped uh, for exposure um, to get us out there a little bit. And we're actually uh, still on the festival route like we've still got more festivals coming up and so that should be another year to be honest wow okay and, and indeed that's while it's in the cinema it's still going around in festivals yeah it's still going I, I think we're in a festival literally the second week of the cinema run so mm -hmm. we're in the Eindhoven Film Festival in Holland so okay. Oh, that's yeah. excellent. That's excellent. And then, as you said, uh, Knuckle Dust, which was the one that you originally wanted to work on first, but obviously you didn't have the budget for it. Mm -hmm. um, now you're getting, are you getting traction on Knuckle Dust? We are getting traction on Knuckle Dust. Um, so basically uh, a fantastic uh, company called Futuristic Films, uh, run by a wonderful guy called Julian Lafleur. Um, basically they saw uh, Hilo Joe in the very early stages when it was being uh, edited together, uh, at a company called Zebra, where he was working as a producer. Um, he then said, look, would you, do you have sound yet? We have no sound. Uh, you know, we have no soundtrack or anything. Um, it was going to be me playing, you know, scissors, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, Noel Gallagher style. Um, but he managed to get a great company called AOC to come on door, uh, do the soundtrack. So mm -hmm. we had a fantastic composer called Benjamin Sheldon. So it's an original soundtrack. Um, and then they said, have you got any other scripts? And I obviously had Knuckle Dust. I gave them that. They bought that in like 24 hours. Nice. With the, uh, agreement that I direct it. Okay. Um, so now we're 80% cast. Um, funding's nearly there. Um, we're in the final throes of, you know, getting there to go into pre-production. Okay. Um, so, yes, that that will be my second film. So that's your second film. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I know you started off as an actor. Are you still carrying on, on, the, uh, on the acting side or have you basically parked that because the, the film director career has kicked off? Um, I've par parked it in a sense. I mean, you know, I just wouldn't have time to go away and do 
you know, a play or something sure. like that anymore. But equally, you know, I think, oddly, I think I've got like five films out next year um, because, you know, mates have asked me to do stuff, oh, okay. uh, to come in and do stuff. And you're like, the moment you say you can't do anything, people are like, hey, do you want to come do this? And it's yeah, like, oh, I'm just okay, going to cool. pull my, uh, my treatment back now. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, yeah, so there's a couple of films out next year. There's a, you know, there's Dead in a Week or Your Money Back, which is uh, produced by my friend Dan Cooper um, with Chris Eccleston and uh, Tom Wilkinson, um, a film called The Tombs by okay. a director called Dan Brownlee. Um, we just did a film, so Futuristic Films, uh, where I'm now head of creative development, they hired me after a, like a year of working with them. Oh, nice, OK. Um, we just did a film out in Latvia called The Sonata, which mm. was with uh, Rutger Hauer, uh, Freya Tingley, Simon Abkarian, um, really great cast. Um, and we finished that on Saturday. OK. Uh, so we just come back and I've got a little pie in that as well. Oh, fair enough. Oh, I, that was going to be my next question. Are you thinking of directing any movies that you're going to be starring in? So doing the Robert Redford, um, you know, uh, George Clooney thing where you're director, actor, producer, writer, etc. Well, I'm, I'm in Knuckle Dust, so uh, yeah. <laughs> Main character? Uh, no, I'm a supporting character. Okay. Um, I'm in High Low, you know, supporting character. Um, so I think I'm, you know, I'd like to do that in the future, but I'd like mm -hmm. to build up to it and, you know. Sure work into it okay excellent this is shoot the breeze uh, on resonance 104.4 fm i'm marcus e Acco. and i'm laura Sampson. with us in the studio the director of high low joe james kermack and the cmo of uh, film label nick sadler uh here to talk about uh, high low joe uh so uh we will we'll park on the uh on the barrage of questions that we've been asking you so far <laughs> we're going to move to a new segment that we started well it's not new anymore we've been doing it for about four weeks which is the uh, musical interlude uh and we're going to be playing el mariachi from uh, el mariachi Great track. Yeah, I was trying to keep it in theme, which is basically like a uh, you know, first. El Mariachi by Robert Rodriguez from the movie El Mariachi. Although it's on the soundtrack for Once Upon a Time in Mexico, still an El Mariachi uh, movie. Mm -hmm. um, you're listening to Shoot the Breeze on Resonance 104.4 FM. I am Marcus E. Acco. And I'm Laura Sampson. And with us, like I mentioned earlier, the director of High Low Joe, uh, James Kermack, and Nick Sadler, the CMO of uh, Film Label, uh, here promoting High Low Joe. So the next segment is uh, UK Box Office Top 5. <laughs> So, James, I'm assuming that because you've been so busy, you've not watched any of the movies in the top five. I have not watched any of the movies in the. I haven't watched any of the movies in the top five. Yet. Okay, I've right. away, but yeah. Well, number number five is Jigsaw. So mm -hmm. you know about the Saw franchise, right? Yeah, I know the Saw franchise. Um, yeah, I love the first uh, Saw film. Yep. I really enjoy the first Saw film. I think it's a great theatrical piece and a great setup. Um, I'm not a massive fan. Like I love horror films, but mm -hmm. pure gore. Yep, I'm a bit. Out. No, I, I'm I'm with you. I said this last week when we when this first popped in the top five. I was I I, I love the first one. Second one, I thought okay was fine. Third one, I started seeing where it was going down, and then I just I gave up after that, and then found out that they made like five other movies after that. Mm -hmm. So and now they just retitled it Jigsaw, where they're starting from the beginning. Um, so but that's number five. I guess it's just uh, coming out after I'm a, Halloween. I'm a bit of a suck over these type of films um, but it's not one that I can say was a great film <laughs> you, you, you didn't enjoy it? no? well <laughs> I'm not sure whether I'd like to admit that I uh, you can you can enjoy it. enjoy it I won't mock you I promise I always say I'm not going to mock you and I, I never do do I? 
Never. 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 <laughs> yeah. No. Fair enough. That's number five. Number four, A Bad Mum's Christmas. Uh, so this is, um, we have Mila Kunis back, uh, Kristen Bell, uh, um, Catherine... Han. Catherine Han, thank you. Um, and they are joined by Susan Sarandon, uh, Christine Baranski, and Cheryl Hines. Uh, so they're stacking up the uh, the cast. I... I I kind of, I, I want to, okay, you know, I can't muster up the energy. I, I didn't, I, I thought the first one was okay. It was possible. Uh, Mila Kunis, I like Mila Kunis. She's great. And Kristen Bell, love her and everything she does. Uh, but eh, it was, you know, I, I'm surprised there was a sequel, which is Bad Man's Christmas. But obviously they're trying to cash in on, on the uh, Christmas uh, festival, uh, Christmas season. So that's why the sequels come out. Am I going to go watch it? Nope. Um, I'm not going to watch it. Um, my wife is, <laughs> and she's going to tell me how great it was. I know she's planning on seeing that this weekend. I, on the other hand, am probably going to see the next one on the list, which is number three, Thor Ragnarok. I've seen that already. Amazing. It is. <laughs> You're going to see it again. <laughs> I'm not going to see this with my wife, but I will go see Thor again. I will. Yes, I will go and see Thor again uh, because I, I said this last week. Uh, the, so far, uh, my rankings in the Marvel movies uh, for me, number one, Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, volume one, is my favorite. Um, at the moment, uh, Avengers Assemble is number two. But the only reason why it's number two is because I haven't seen Thor Ragnarok again. Um, I, I, because that's number three. I'm going to see it again. Get all the jokes again and laugh at it. Uh, Taika Waititi, he knocked it out of the park. Yeah, it's, I mean, he's, a, he's an epic director. Yeah. He's fantastic. And it's 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 great. It's got all the nice little in-jokes in there. So, uh, yeah, definitely go see it. It is, and it's... Uh, well, I'm always surprised when these films are actually kind of accurate to the mythology, but it does some really interesting things, sort of kind of in-jokes with, um, with the material that it comes from as well. Yeah. And since it came out in the U.S., it's gone in it's made an insane amount of money it's, i mean it's nearly 30 million in the uk that's because but. it's that good that's what i'm telling you we should go see it i'm going to go you know what i'm going to go see it straight after this i saw it 3 days before its official yeah uh release date and uh i um i mentioned at the time i think that it's a real cheat that weekend box office figures for you know, on a <laughs> wednesday wednesday yeah, it, it, Wednesday? Okay, we talked about this the last time that you brought Sorry, this up. I, I remain incredulous. Which is why I don't care about the box office figures, because obviously, as you said, they open up on the Wednesday, but they call it weekend box office, so they kind of kind of class. And that. that's, that's how the industry works. But still, it's an amazing film. Go and see Thor Ragnarok if you haven't seen it already. I second that. Yeah, number two is Murder on the Orient Express. James, you have someone in High Low Joe that's in Murder on the Orient Express, don't you? I do indeed. We have Tom Bateman, uh, who is in uh, Murder on the Orient Express who was also in uh, Snatched recently with Goldie Horn. Oh, okay. Um, and, uh, and Amy, Amy Schumer. Schumer. Yes. Amy Schumer. Um, yeah, he's a fantastic actor. Um, really, really good guy. Um, we were very lucky to get him on High Low. Um, I say lucky. I was having a meeting in the Curzon about High Low. Mm -hmm. He was there for another meeting. Um, hey, James, how you doing? What are you up to? Meeting for High Low. Cool. Oh, cool. Anything for me in there? Yeah, oh, yeah, nice. yeah, sure. Um, so I'll send you the script tonight. Um, so th that's how we got Tom. Um, that's, how, that's how it works. Just basically go and hang out where you're... If, you, if you've got a movie... So all the aspiring film directors, film makers out there, this is what James is saying. James is saying, basically, go and stalk your favorite actors, yep. find out where they hang out, pretend to hang out there for a meeting, and then just basically say, oh, you're here too? Oh, yeah, that's what I'm doing. Oh, I've got yeah, this picture. Yeah, yeah. And just hope that if they don't ask, just throw that in there. Just say, yeah. aren't you going to ask me? Is there a part for you in this? Well, I mean, I can do, the thing is, I can't do it now. He's huge now. And uh, so, you know... Uh, I think I got him at a very lucky time. But it's true. I mean, hey, at the end of the day, you've got you've, you, that gives you star power. It gives you movie star power, and it gets uh, you got a film uh, film distribution company that's picked it. I know that's not the reason why you picked mm. it up, obviously. But you know, the the as you said, uh, James's character and personality was what won you over. But it helps as that package. In it there, does, so. of course. I mean, what's great is Tom's fantastic. But equally, you know, uh, I mean, obviously, he's one of the larger names along with uh, Gethin Anthony from Game of Thrones. I was trying my best not to bring him up, but yeah, that's <laughs> yeah fine. me and Marcus both know Gethin. <laughs> Yeah, yeah so and he's awesome. Uh, and again, he's one of my best pals, so this is how I cast off. Yeah. Um, but equally, <laughs> you know, the two leads in it also, Matthew Stathers and Lizzie Phillips, are fantastic actors. And, and mm -hmm. you know, everyone kind of holds their own with each other within their scenes. Excellent. Excellent. And that's, I know we just completely sidetracked the, the number two, which is Murder, Murder on the Orient Express. But hey, who cares? Uh, that movie's doing well. It's number two. We're talking High Low Joe as well, so it's fine. And number one is Paddington 2. Uh, this movie, uh, I, I, I want to go see it. I'm going to take my kids to go and see it because you have to see 
see Paddington 2. You have to see Paddington 1 and Paddington 2 in the same day. Okay. And you just have to take the day off work. Yeah, and fair just, enough. And just maybe have a marmalade sandwich on the way home. <laughs> and you just have to pay proper homage what if to he, what if Paddington. He, but that's the thing. I don't like marmalade sandwiches. I like jam sandwiches. Can I take if a jam sandwich? If you watch Paddington no. for long enough, no, no. you will no. like no. marmalade sandwiches. So, but I don't like films. I don't think that's how marmalade works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's exactly, yeah. Fil- films dictating what I should eat. The, the last time that a film did that to me was Once Upon a Time in Mexico, where I now eat puerco pabil, and it's, and I don't get me wrong, pulled pork, I like it, it's all right. But then you know now I'm eating it. I order it every time I go to a Mexican restaurant. I, I don't want to start getting on the marmalade. Bamboo just because of Paddington Bear. And they never serve that in Mexican restaurants. There's no marmalade ever. <laughs> well, so marmalade, well, you're well, struggle anyway. Exactly, right? And how's, how's that going to go with my pulled pork? Can I have pulled pork? Does, does, that, does it sound disgusting having pork in a marmalade sandwich? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah? No, it? no, absolutely no, not. Is, marmalade is something, one of the main things that you use to cover ham at Christmas okay. you know yeah, okay. shares, that and shares shares in marmalade. I didn't know <laughs> <laughs> hey guys just so you know marmalade's pretty cool everyone should get some is that why you were saying they should be our, <laughs> our, our, our shareholders uh, you know, you know uh, the reason I asked that is because I have very weird sandwiches well what I get I, for, to me they're normal but I get told they're weird I have like a bread banana biscuit um, cho- chocolate biscuit and then bread and, and that's that usually I that's go with the Maryland. The Mar- that's that's awesome. not that's that's, that's good, amazing. right? Yeah. There you go. Like the Maryland cookies. The cool awesome. cookie. There you go. So that's what I was asking. If you can put um, pulled pork in a marmalade sandwich, if you can put pulled pork in a marmalade sandwich, I might have that. Then go and watch Paddington Bear. I really hope this one. is a segment that you keep every week now. Um, <laughs> marmalade. What does it go in? <laughs> yeah, different brands. And it's like, yeah. If there if there are any uh, brands out there of um, you know marmalade and want to sponsor the show, feel free. Give us a call. Uh, you're listening to Shoot the Breeze on Resonance 104. Point four FM. I am Marcus Iaco. And I'm Laura Sampson. With us in the studio, we have James Kermack, the director of Hilo Joe, and Nick Sadler, the CMO of Film Label, who's promoting Hilo Hi- Joe, which is coming out November 24th. Unfortunately, you can't buy the tickets for the uh, the View Cinema Piccadilly. Yeah, correct? the premiere is sold out, but we still got tickets for the other seven screenings. Yes. So, uh, where are the, uh, are the screenings that are available? Uh, we got Fulham Broadway uh, We got uh, in London. We got Brighton, Hull, Cardiff, Liverpool, Leeds, and Oxford. So what dates do you have for those ones? Um, we, I do not have them right in my eyes. Okay. Um, but what we can do is you, we, you know, we'll put them on your Facebook page and stuff like that. Perfect. They can uh, check out Hilo Joe uh, Facebook page. Oh, which is or, at Hilo Joe underscore movie, correct? That's correct. Yep. And also on Twitter. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, and that's the same on Twitter. Uh, we'll put the we can put the dates uh, on the uh, uh, Shoot the Breeze web um, not website uh, Facebook page, which is Shoot the Breeze on Resonance one hundred four point four FM, as well as our Twitter page. We'll shoot that out as well. It's STB underscore uh, Resonance FM. I have to make sure I said STB. Um, not STD, which someone corrected me the other day. Um, it's not STD. It's STB underscore Resonance FM. This has really gone downhill really quickly. <laughs> Marmalade <laughs> and STDs. Yeah, <laughs> hey, that's, that's how we roll. <laughs> uh, so our next segment is, uh, well, actually, now I guess we're moving into our big uh, segment, right? With our top five, um, uh, top five film movie discussion. That's our next segment. <laughs> Here's the scenario. You are a time-traveling thief. You've been hired by an enigmatic billionaire to time-travel and steal five debut movies, uh, five of the best debut movies in the history of films. So you get in your time machine, you travel uh, across the centuries from 1920s right through to 2017, and you pick five movies on a list. But then you see these five movies and you think, no, there's no way that you're going to give this these five movies away. I mean, you, you now hold these movies that no one else is going to see except you. So what you do is you take the five movies that you've just stolen and you find the dark recesses of time and you sit there and you just keep watching these five movies over and over and over again. All of these are just basically our way of introducing our top five movie, uh, film and, uh, and TV discussion, which today is going to be the debut, uh, the 
uh, top five favorite debuts of uh, directors. So I've got my five. Laura, you've got your five. James, you've got your five. I have. Uh, Nick, unfortunately, we didn't ask you to get a five. But uh, Nick can you, share mine. It's fine. Do you like wanna, it. I I've imagine Nick one. will also I've like one. what I've got. You've got one. Okay, you've got, you've yeah. got one. <laughs> Fool, I wonder what it's going to be. Yeah, it's going to be. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll wait. So James, being our guest, we'll get you to tell us your number five and your number four. Okay, so I, I, I did five, five to one, but this is like in order of, not my top five, but this is in order of time in in that i watched it okay uh so at five i have uh get out jordan peele oh, which is the most recent nice. one that i've seen uh which is just ridiculous uh, it's, it's insanely good film yeah um i went to see the cinema where i got the last ticket on the day it came out mm -hmm. and i was packed into the cinema i was right at the front right in front of the screen and it's one of the only screens i've ever seen where people were shouting at the screen yep talking to each other what the what's going on no don't do that um, yep. It's an amazing film, and we've watched it. I mean, oh, my girlfriend's here, by the way, so not me and Nick. Me and Nick haven't watched it together. Um, it's but, fine. No one's judging. It's fine. But um, I got Lisa to watch it as well, but I've seen it like four times this year already. Oh, that's that's, that's more than I have. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen it twice, and I'm, I would happily go see that again, so mm -hmm. I'll go see that with you and your girlfriend and yes, Nick if and you Nick. want, so that'd be good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, why not? Yeah, <laughs> you know, Get Out is an amazing film, uh, we'll, but we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Uh, what's your number four? Uh, number four I had is Tyrannosaur, Paddy Considine, oh, yeah. um, which I saw at the cinema uh, when it first came out. And literally, I, I think I was over in. I think I was in post for Hilo, um, and sat outside the cinema for a good hour and a half in silence. Just what, just shut the film down. What am I doing? This is that's insanely good. <laughs> you just, um, you it, just you it, end everything and just walk uh, away. It's like, I, no, it's, it's good. It's done. It, it's just superb. I mean, Mullen and Coleman and Marsan are three of the greatest actors we have working at the moment. Um, and Paddy Constantine's an amazing writer director. I mean, had the uh, good fortune to go see his second film, Journeyman, at a private screening, um, which is. I mean, I was, it was embarrassing because I'm a huge Paddy Constantine fan. And yeah. My mate was doing Ferryman with him at the time. Okay. Uh, and so at the end, he was like, hey, you know, James, this is Paddy. The film, I was in tears already. Yep. So I was like, hey, hey, <laughs> Paddy Constantine, a huge fan of your work. And I was like in tears. And I was like, damn it, man, why did you introduce me then? This is ridiculous. You could have carried on going, like, I, I have knuckle dust here <laughs> with me. You should be dead. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> but yeah, if you haven't seen uh, Tyrannosaurus, so it's, it's one of the greatest films of all time, bar none. I know, I've heard a lot. That's actually uh, on my list to watch. I was supposed to watch it this weekend, but I was binge watching something else, which is going to be one of my um, uh, recommendations later on. Uh, Tyrann so that's Tyrannosaur number four and mm -hmm. Get Out is uh, number five. Yes. Laura, what is your number five and what is your number four? Well, my number five is The Babadook. Yes. Uh, directed ba by Jennifer Kent. Babadook. And it's really really scary uh i quite like haunted house movies i was i'm a particular fan of um the uh changeling films like yeah. a, uh, a couple of uh, a couple of different remakes of those and this was it just had all the elements that i love in a horror scare movie yeah. uh, it was kind of there was kind of a creeping fear that i started that started to infect me there mm -hmm. was a like a i thought a really well a well told that difficult relationship between some of the main characters and that kind of deepened the horror of it for me so uh so yeah it's uh that's my number five Bobby looks very good very good mm -hmm. call and my number four is a Korean film that I actually only saw a few weeks ago as part of London's Korean Film Festival called People in the Slum by Bae Chang Ho. I saw it at the Close Up Film Centre in a special screening and it was the director who is one of Korea's most famous film directors, not that we'd know it here. You still haven't given um, me the list of uh, Korean films that you're going to see. You haven't given me that list yet. Ah, yes. Something to post on the to-do list. Right. But it's a, kind of a love triangle movie, really beautifully shot in a um, shantytown just outside Seoul. And it's really moving. There's a... I don't want to give too much away, but there's a, a son who doesn't know who his father is and uh, his... Um, <laughs> it's so difficult. Uh, Do you want to just, should we just give the spoiler alert? Does Bruce Willis die at the end? Yeah. Is that... It, it, was, is it no a sled one, uh, or is it no, no one dies and in the end people don't have to accept as bad a fate as they thought they would have to so it's a it's a really happy ending and you've ruined it for me i can't go watch it now well come, you should have said spoiler before you did that <laughs> and uh yeah it's just uh i think it's really that it's really beautifully shot and it was um t something new and strange for me to so see what, 
So what was the title for that? So people it's go called watch it? People in the Slum. People in the Slum. And it was directed by a Korean director called Bae Chang Ho. It came out in 1982. It wasn't actually allowed to be shown outside of Korea for a very long time because it depicted poverty in yeah. Korea, which the regime at the time didn't approve of. But now, happily, things aren't uh, quite so strict. Okay, so that's Babadook, number five, and People in the Slum, number four. Oh, that's uh, those are your choices. Uh, Babadook, I respect. People in Islam, I've never heard of, so I'll, ch- I'll put, ho- put that on the list. I need to watch that. Uh, my number five uh, from 1984, the Coen Brothers, Blood Simple. This movie, it, it, it's I, I love the Coen Brothers. It, the movie is about um, a uh, a bar owner. He, he owns a bar who finds out his wife is having an affair with one of the bartenders. Uh, he had hired a private investigator to find to find him out. He gets presented with proof, and when they want to leave him, or when his wife wants to leave him, he hires the uh, private investigator to go and kill the wife and the boyfriend. And it just go, it's supposed to be a simple plan, and it goes to hell. Uh, pretty much that's the plot for almost every Coen Brothers movie. Um, but Coen Brothers, they're one of my favorite directors. That movie starts off, it, it, I love that movie because of how gritty it is. But another reason why I put that on the list is mainly how they made the movie. There's this legend going around about, and this, uh, uh, James, you probably know this story already. Yeah. Um, that they they made the movie by basically shooting a trailer for a movie that they hadn't made yet, and they went around sh- um, showing it to different people, saying, "Look, this is a movie we've made. Do you want to invest in it?" and so on. And people were investing in a movie they thought had already been made. They took all that money and just basically shot the extra scenes and just filled that. Uh, the other eighty eight minutes, exactly <laughs> right. Uh, so that uh, alone is one of the reasons why I put that as my number five. That is uh, the Coen Brothers' Blood Simple. My number four, you've already mentioned it, is Get Out. Is Jordan Peele, two thousand and seventeen. Daniel Kaluuya, Alison Williams. Bradley Whitford. It's about uh, um, a a black uh, a black male, black man, uh, played by Daniel Kaluuya, uh, called Chris Washington, who is taken by his white girlfriend to her uh, ultra liberal parents' house or home uh, for the weekend to enjoy uh, some celebration. And it's it plays with racial tension and uh, ra- uh, racial expectation and stereotypes. So beautifully, uh, I was having a conversation with someone earlier today about a particular scene uh, where I, I mentioned to the person that because they were white, they may not necessarily understand the um, some 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 of the uh, you know some some of the, how it resonates with some of the people, with people who are black who are watching it. For example, a police officer shows up at a particular scene where in a normal film it would be, you know, celebration. But in for this particular character, because he's black, it's a complete opposite. And that's why this movie is so fantastic, which is why when you mentioned it as your number five, you said number five. Five in, in order of time coming out, sure. not in order of how good the film is. Absolutely. And it's Jordan Peele's first one, Jordan Peele from uh, Key and Peele. Which uh, is awesome. If you haven't watched that, Key and Peele is hilarious yeah. and also really on the money with uh, social stuff exactly. within the comedy. So that's my number four. So my number five was Blood Simple. Number four was Get Out. You're listening to Shoot the Breeze on Resonance 104.4 FM. I am Marcus E. Echo. And I'm Laura Sampson. With us in the studio, the director of High Low Joe, James Kermack, and the uh, distributor of High Low Joe, uh, Nick Sadler. Uh, we are talking top five favorite debuts by directors. James, um, we, uh, just before we go to James for your number three and your number two, uh, Miguel Ortega uh, mentioned Boys in the Hood. Uh, John mm-hmm. Singleton uh, and uh, this oh god I remember watching mm. that yep. I really remember watching that and Brilliant this film. is Spinal Tap yeah they were Spinal oh. Tap and Boys in the Hood were in my top 20 when I was doing this list down from like 80 to 5 yeah that's the thing you get a whole bunch a whole list and, and one of the reasons why well because I looked at I looked at my list and I put I started off by putting a lot of my favorite directors on there and then started crossing a lot of them off because I was thinking yeah I like their work afterwards but their first films mm. weren't that great mm. uh, but my top five for me anyway and the ones that you've been mentioning I saw your list earlier I re- you absolutely both your lists I really like the people on there uh, and the work itself some of them I need to catch up on Tyrannosaur uh, people in the slums need to catch up on them uh, James what is your number three and what's your number two number three was Away From Her which is a, a film by oh, Sarah Polly yes. it's, fa- it's an amazing film uh, about a woman played by Julie Christie who gets Alzheimer's and she's been living with her husband for many many years uh, and basically she starts to forget who he is so it's basically uh a film where this couple kind of fall apart but one of them has to watch the other one completely forgetting who they are uh, it's, a, it's a ridiculously good film really heartbreaking Sarah Polly is a huge talent um, and I mean this was a few years back maybe six seven years ago she did this she's only done one film since which is Take This Waltz which again is a great film Michelle Williams yeah. um, Seth Rogen I think it was and um, uh, Sarah Silverman right 
Uh, yes, yeah. um, but that's been, you know, it's another three, four years since she hasn't got to make another film. I think she's been working on a documentary, but, I mean, this woman should be writing and directing films every year. It's, she's unbelievable. Yeah, she's, a, she's an actress as well. She's so an I mean, actress. Yeah. She was, she was, uh, you might recognise her from uh, Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead, which yes, is his is. debut. Um, and my number two was... Uh, uh, House Party, Reginald <laughs> Hudlin, yeah. um, which is an amazing film. Um, it, I remember watching it as a kid, and you know, I, I grew up on a council estate. But you know, I'm a white boy, um, and uh, you're white. I'm white. <laughs> if you don't know on this uh, radio show, I am white. Um, but House Party is an unbelievable film, and, and you know, watching it, you, I was always just kind of like, that, that's the party I want to go to yep. when I'm old enough. That's that's the party. Kid and uh, play Martin Lawrence. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm still trying, um, <laughs> but you know, uh, it is the what it is. But I remember having my big baggy pants and trying to do the kick dance yep. and uh, you know no one wanted to do it with me but that's fine Oh, no ways we can do it at the end of the show that's yeah, cool, absolutely man. hey I do that every wedding <laughs> I go to yeah. I have a number of people so you, number five so you, number three was um, away, away from, from her. her number two Hudlin who's got um, he's just got a uh, Marshall coming out of Chadwick Boseman <gasps> oh, yeah, which looks okay. fantastic that's cool um, uh, yeah that's one on my list to watch mm. as well uh, okay Laura what's your number three what's your number two well my number three is Whitnell and I uh Bruce Robinson's first directorial debut, although he'd done lots of stuff before. Um, if anyone in the world hasn't watched it, it's about uh, two out-of-work actors, one posh, one slightly less posh, who have adventures in their house, in their local area, and in on holiday. In a, by mistake. In a, yeah. By mistake, in a country house. Uh, where there's a slightly uh, predatory uncle who um, who really enjoys the company, shall we say. Um, I think that movie is, a, is required watching for any university student, any university, any boy going to university. Because uh, when I, when I, that was basically all I heard when I was at university. Have you watched Wooden Light, Wooden Light, Wooden Light? I was like, okay, I watched it. I was like, just two guys getting drunk. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's a good film. It's not just two guys getting it's, drunk. Yeah. No, I think... Uh, no, I know, but yeah, but it's just the, with the hype, it's like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, it's, the best, it's, it's some of the best dialogue that's ever been. Absolutely, yeah. Bruce Robinson is uh, an, uh, an amazing, amazing writer. He's uh, quite stunning, actually, if you read any of his novels as well. He's a huge talent. And Richard, so, uh, Richard E. Grant, right, just uh, is uh, as Whitnell. Yeah. That, that was Richard E. Grant. The yeah. Richard E. Grant and uh, uh, Paul, McGann. Paul McGann. Yeah. Um, and Richard Griffith. Yes. Yeah. God rest his soul. <laughs> so that was your number three. What's your number two? My number two is Beasts of the Southern Wild, yeah. um, directed by... Ben Zeitlin in 2012. Um, it uh, stars a six-year-old um, whose name in the film is Hush Puppy and whose name in real life I still can't Quivon. quite pronounce. Quivon, Qu Quivon Janae yeah. Wallace, Wallace. Yeah. Yeah. who was the, the most... The most brilliant child actress I've ever seen. But she, uh, in the film, lives with her father who becomes ill. And when he becomes ill, things start happening in the environment. Um, the water levels in the Louisiana Bayou where they live rise and um, the and ice shelves melt. And these um, mythological creatures called aurochs um, are released from the ice. And so there's there's just a really kind of a dreamy, um, powerful sort of incantatory atmosphere to the whole film, which I just got completely sucked into, and um, that's why it's my number two. What did you think of it? I I, I love that movie. That movie's so beautiful. Um, it, it's uh, it, it, the what's soundtrack's tr amazing as well. Isn't the soundtrack's it? amazing to write to. It's fantastic. It, 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 another thing that struck me with it is was uh, Kwanjane Wallace. Um, that was her first film, and she's that young. She was nominated for an Oscar at the same time that um, I can't remember which uh, actress. She was the oldest actress for a French movie. It was in the same year that the youngest actress and the oldest actress got nominated for an Oscar at the same time. But she, her, her performance was so powerful. She was um, something like four years old when she got cast or yeah, something like that, wasn't Something she? along those lines. Uh, and it, it, you, again, I know bringing another movie, kind of measuring it up, Beasts of No Nation with Abraham Atta. Just be, it kind of reminded me of how, how those two actors, just so powerful... Pretty much blowing out, blowing away everyone else on the screen. That's one thing I took away from that movie, and I I would have expected her to do a lot more. I know she went to do, to do Annie after that, mm. um, but then haven't seen her in anything else. I know she she voiced um, something in Trolls, 
but that's about it so far. But uh, I guess it's maybe her parents are just trying to keep her safe from from the industry to introduce her, you know, slowly. But I want to see more from her because she was t- she was just ter- terrific in that particular in in that movie. Uh, but yeah, gr- those are great picks. Uh, Whitney and I and uh, Beasts of the Sub. No, um, Whitney and I and Beasts of the Beasts Southern of the Wild. Wild. Yeah. yeah, not Beasts of No Nation. That mm-hmm. is Abraham Mata, but still great movie. Uh, my number three is. Uh, in, from 2004, Edgar Wright, Shaun of the Dead. Uh, I raved about this on our Halloween episode. Uh, it basically rejuvenated for me, anyway, the zombie uh, zombie movies. Even though it was a comedy, it was still it wasn't scary, but it was it was funny. Uh, Simon Pegg, Nick Frost, great witty script. Uh, Almost, almost sublime editing. Love the way Edgar Wright with with that film and all these other films after after that moves with editing, where he, moving from one scene to the next, it's part of the story. It's not a simple case of exterior shot. You see a car driving. It's nothing like that. It's part of the fun of the story, which is why I like Shaun of the Dead. Um, it, it just it, it's such a good movie. If you haven't seen it, go see it. It's it's about uh, zombies pretty much attacking a, um, a layabout in London uh, and him and his housemate have to pretty much get their girl, his girlfriend or his ex-girlfriend from her house to the pub. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know who hasn't seen that movie. Um, I don't like people that don't like that movie. Mm-hmm. I know that's, that's exaggeration, but uh, yeah, I know some people that don't like that movie. I'm still trying to convince them, but anyway. Uh, but that's my number three, Shaun of the Dead. My number two, 1941, John Huston, The Maltese Falcon. Um, love this movie. Uh, I grew up on Dashiell Hammett novels. Uh, Sam Spade is, for me, one of the best uh, private detectives. It's Humphrey Bogart. The story is about uh, this uh, private detective whose partner gets killed, and he's basically investigating that death, as well as uh, a gorgeous lady who comes in to, to hire him to find uh, to, to find out who's trying to kill her and he gets entangled in these three different criminals who are chasing this uh, elusive um, artifact called the Maltese Falcon and it's an amazing film It's I know it's old, it's black and white there are a lot of people who shy away from black and white movies don't go and watch them, some of them are the best you've seen uh, so you're listening to Shoot the Breeze on Resonance 104.4 FM we are talking our favourite uh, uh, debut directorial debuts let's talk about our number ones uh, I would jump in Jack Flash, uh, Whoopi Goldberg, yeah. uh, directed by Penny Marshall, uh, which in the 80s is huge because it was a female director and a female lead. Um, it's one of the first films I ever saw. And then Penny Marshall went on to do Big for her next film. Yeah. So if you're going to do a debut feature, which is Jump and Jack Flash, one of the greatest comedies of all time, and then go on to Big, I think you're an awesome, awesome director. And Whoopi Goldberg is, uh, I mean, she moved from there, went and started doing, she did Color Purple, did a whole bunch of other things. She's an amazing actress. She should be doing major, major films. She's now. one of the few EGOT holders, right? So she's got an Oscar, Grammy, Emmy and uh, Tony mm-hmm. so yeah that's good okay Nick I know we've been going around and around and we haven't talked to you in a while do you want to give us one of your favorite debuts uh, from a director um Pie by Darren Evanovsky. I thought you were going to go high low Joe oh. <laughs> why not it's like this is what am I parenting. paying for I know right <laughs> no well but- there would be two but yeah I, uh, I randomly saw that film uh, uh, as a student and it was on like a late night it was I was in New Zealand and I think it was on Sky or something I had no idea and was completely blown away mm-hmm. and then I remember just like looking up like who's this guy and then and following his career and and you know he's he's, he's a legend. Nah, so it has a good call. Pie, Laura, what's your number one? My number one is Perfect Blue by uh, directed by Satoshi Kon. It is a anime film, and the first, um, actually the first ever film that Satoshi Kon directed, which is unusual for things that actually make it into a English um, subtitle uh, movie. Um, he did lots of things. Um, after that, but this is a, about a, a pop singer turned actress who gets a stalker, and lots of uh, weird, sometimes supernatural things happen. Yeah, after that, I, I've, I've heard I heard about that pretty recently, and I want to get that on my list as well to watch it. My number one, uh, two thousand and five, Joss Whedon, Serenity. Uh, if you've listened to this show for how many how many episodes we've had, you've heard me talk about Serenity, talk about Firefly. The opening sample for this is, of this show is. Um, is Firefly. Uh, it's a clip from Firefly. I love this movie. Joss Whedon is one of my favorite writer-directors ever. So uh, that movie, Serenity, I've watched it almost 100 times. 
Go and watch it if you haven't seen it. Well, we've got 30 seconds left on the show. Uh, enough time for our segment for Netflix and Amazon. James, you said you had one for Netflix and one for Amazon? Yeah, I'd say watch Mindhunter on Netflix. It's, it's amazing. This for me, and if you haven't seen it, watch Banshee on Amazon. Oh, is Banshee on Amazon Banshee now? Banshee is on Amazon and it's the greatest show of all time. Awesome. Laura, what do you want to recommend? I want to recommend all the Bond films that just came on Amazon Prime. Okay, for me, Netflix, it is uh, Big Mouth. Uh, you're listening to Shoot the Breeze on Resonance 104.4 FM. James, uh, Nick, Thank you very much for joining us. No problem. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, you. Thank you for listening. And see you next week.